worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only way when we never say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you.
Great to have you here, and it's great to be together. There's something really, really cool about coming together. And, uh, and that's what we're going to do today is, is we're going to think about what it means to come together and to go, come together for uh, the work of God. And so um, we've been working our way through this particular series entitled Great is Thy Faithfulness. And uh, the, the last few weeks, other than the, the wonderful mission um, presentation uh, from uh, the youth trip to, to Nashville from, from last week. We've been focused on the first few chapters of Nehemiah. And uh, while we are not going to read um, the entire chapter this morning, which is uh, Nehemiah chapter 3, um, there are, I believe, 31 verses. Let me check here, make sure that's what I had. 32. All right, I was off by one. 32 verses. We're not going to read all through. 32, because it is kind of structured as a list, um, we're uh, nevertheless going to pick out some, some wonderful truths there. Um, I don't know if you're like anything like me, um, uh, but, uh, but I, when I go to the grocery store, which isn't often, occasionally I try to take it off of um, Krista's plate and things. Um, I don't know, again, ladies... Um, Krista hates to go to the grocery store. Um, I don't know if you like to go to the grocery store. Um, I don't think it's necessarily anything exciting, right? But um, because I go more on a, on, on a rare, on those rare occasions when I go, I always take a list with me. Uh, usually it's on my cell phone um, because I know my weaknesses. And my weakness is that um, if I don't go with a list, I buy everything I don't need and none of what I do need. Um, I have a tendency to to walk in um, at Kroger or at Walmart or whatever, and I have a tendency to walk down every aisle. I start at aisle one, and I go aisle one and aisle two, and just kind of pick out the things that really just kind of, the the worst time to go is when I'm really hungry, because I just, and it's just junk food, right? So um, the bottom line is, is, when we skip over a list or when we don't use a list, um, we do miss some things. And I, and I think in this particular um, passage, while we're not going to read through the entire list or the journey around the city of Jerusalem, um, nevertheless, we're going to look at some principles that are there. And you're going to find over and over and over there are some key terms that are used here in this passage that allow us to be able to see what's at the heart of what Nehemiah is teaching. Now, if you haven't been here for the last few weeks, um, chapter 1 begins with bad news. Um, Nehemiah is in the service of King Artaxerxes in a city called Susa. And, uh, and while he is there, he is the cupbearer, and he has the responsibility of basically holding the life of the king in his hands. He is the most trusted person in the entire court, maybe in the entire kingdom, because he checks the wine and the food at every meal to make sure that it is not poisoned. Um, It's pretty common, um, if you look through history, that those who are in the position of leadership have a target on their back, on their forehead, wherever you want to put that target. And, uh, And Artaxerxes similarly had his enemies. And so the person who was most trusted was the cupbearer. Nehemiah filled that particular position. Now, he's there at the city. He has not been to Jerusalem. Um, the, um, the Jews had returned back after exile to the city um, to rebuild the temple and to rebuild the city. But um, news comes to him through one of his brothers and a contingency from Jerusalem comes to Nehemiah, and they basically say, you know what? He asked the question. He says, well, how are things with my people, and how is the city? And the response is, well, the city is still in complete, uh, in, 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 is, is, in, is destroyed. Um, the, the, the walls are, are broken down. The gates um, are, are non-existent. And, uh, and the people are, are suffering. And his response in chapter 1 is, is uh, immediately to, to fast and to pray. He prays. He weeps. And he cries out to God, he acknowledges their, their sin, but he also puts into perspective um, that God is over all things and that he is sovereign. And even the circumstances that are currently there in Jerusalem are in the hand of a loving, caring, glorious God. And so chapter 2 um, 
after, after prayer and after um, um, seeking God's direction, he makes a courageous appeal to the king, Artaxerxes, who coincidentally at one point um, in Ezra chapter 4 um, told Israel that they needed to stop the rebuilding of the wall. So God strategically placed Nehemiah here at this particular time to be able to intercede, one of the most trusted men to intercede on behalf of his people. And he made a courageous appeal before the king. Following this particular appeal there in in chapter 2, we begin to see that he continues with a heartfelt plea to the people. He basically says, listen, we need to go back and we need to rebuild the walls. Are you with me? And they do. They return back to to the city and he does an evaluation of that, uh, of the city and its condition and so on. And he concludes chapter 2 with this confident declaration. He basically, I'll paraphrase here, he basically says, God is going to help us do this. And anyone who is not with us, you're missing out. But so far, all we see in chapter 1 and chapter 2, while there's quite a bit of action in, in prayer and, um, and uh, in, in fasting and in boldness and courage, much of what has happened so far is a bunch of words, isn't it? A lot of talk. A lot of talk in, in chapter 2 in, in trying to motivate the people and trying to appeal to Artaxerxes in, in, in encouraging the people that God is going to be with them and it is going to happen. So here as we transition from chapter 2 to chapter 3, it is time to get to work. It's time for God's people to come together behind God's work. And so you're going to find several key words if you look at this particular chapter, and it's going to begin at a particular location, a specific place here in the particular city and around the walls. Um, I don't know where I put it, but there is, I don't know if, if some of you may have picked them up, we may have run out, but there's a little map of, of the city, maybe you, you picked one of those up. Um, that kind of shows the, the walls and the gates that surround it. What we're going to find here in this particular chapter, we're going to find um, a, a tour of the city around the walls, beginning with the Sheep Gate. If you just, you'll see that, I think, in verse 1 or verse 2, that they begin their work in the, at the Sheep Gate, and it goes counterclockwise all the way around the city and shows how each particular group or individual begins to contribute and come together for the work of rebuilding the city. It's time to work, and it's time to do it together. And so you find again and again, the first four or five verses, you see the word built, and they built, and they built, and they built. Let me read you the first few verses here, and just so you get a, a little bit of a feel for what happens. And then Eliashib, the high priest, rose up with his brothers, and, and the, uh, the brothers, the priests, and they built the sheep gate. They consecrated it, and they set its doors. They consecrated it as far as the Tower of the Hundred, as far as the Tower of Hananel. And next to him, the men of Jericho built. And next to them, Zachar, the son of Imri, built. And the sons of Hassaneah built the fish gate, and so on and so forth. They built, and they built, and they built. What are they building? Later on, by the way, there is another phrase that's used. Uh, the word built is replaced with the word repaired. And so if you skim through the, 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 the rest of the chapter beginning in, in verse 6 and, and following, you're going to see the word repaired over and over and over. So they built and they repaired. They built and they repaired. They built and they repaired. They repaired the fish gate. They repaired the valley gate. They repaired the fountain gate. And so you see this tour that goes all the way around the city, stopping at each gate. The gates are important. The gates are the places where things go into the city and where things go out. They are places of protection. They are also places where where business is done, where thought is exchanged, where the leadership sits. 
The gates were really, really important. And so we see those particular gates highlighted over and over. And they started with the gates. They certainly did all the walls and everybody was working there. But they started with a gate. And they started with a specific gate. Verse 1 begins and says, And Eliashib, the high priest, rose up with his brothers, the priests, and they built the sheep gate. They built. Why did they start with the sheep gate? The sheep gate seems to be something significant, and it is because this is the place where the priests um, would bring in or the people would bring in the sacrificial animals on a regular basis. It was on the north end. If you didn't get one of those little um, maps or whatever, it's on the northeast corner of the city, if you will, if you were were to take an aerial view, and it is uh, close to where the temple is. And the animals would be brought in through that particular gate on a regular basis in order to perform sacrifices. And so here we find that, that this is where they begin. God's work begins at this particular place. Hudson Taylor put it this way as we think about this morning coming together and doing God's work. He says, God's work is not man working for God. It is God's own work, though often wrought through man's hands. And so the t- today I want to acknowledge, first of all, God does all this stuff. Okay? It's, I'm not saying that, that, that work and the results are dependent upon us. But God uses, and as Hudson Taylor says, often wrought, his, his work is often wrought through man's hands. It must be done, as someone else once said, it must be done God's way, with God's resources, and for, most importantly, for his glory. And that certainly wasn't lost on Nehemiah and his message to the people and to, the, to, to, um, uh, to Eliashib and the priests when they began their work. So they began with probably the most important place in the city and their gates. And I think this is an important place for us to start this morning as we begin the chapter. It makes sense since it's verse 1. That is that everything that follows is consecrated by their worship and their surrender to the Lord at their starting point. In other words... What we find here in this particular passage and what we see here and as we look at this is that God's work must always be for God's glorious name. Jerusalem and Israel were the two, the two if you will, Old Testament dramatic exhibits of his glory, right? Throughout the Old Testament... God was going to make himself known to the nations through two things. One was his people. You were going to be, you are going to be a testimony, a witness to the nations for me, was God's statement to his people. And secondly, the city itself was going to be a glorious testament with the temple there and the worship. Um, The city of peace was going to be a testament to the nations of God's greatness and glory. And here lay the city in shambles. And Nehemiah says, we've got to start this right. In chapter 2, he makes this statement. In verse 17, he says, Then I said to them, you see the trouble we're in? Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, key phrase, Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. And if we are in disgrace, God is disgraced. But if we do what we are to do, and we do the work that God has for us, then God is glorified, and he is magnified, and the nations will see how great our God is. So let's begin in the right place here in Jerusalem, and in particular in or at the sheep gate, where sacrifice is made, where worship begins, where God is is glorified and where where he is lifted up. And they consecrated that gate, and they set its doors. They consecrated it as far as the Tower of the Hundred. The, the, The point here that the 
that is being made is that they are being, that this particular place is being consecrated and set apart and it affects everything that they do. While the city and Israel are the Old Testament picture of where God is glorified, these exhibits of his glory, today it is the church that reflects God's glory, whom it, whom it um, or, or excuse me, um, when it grows in Christ's likeness. John chapter 17, Jesus is, this is what Jesus says here in John chapter 17. He says, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them. The glory that you have given me, Jesus says, to the, as he's praying to the Father, I have given to them. That they may be one, those are his disciples, his followers, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one. So that, listen, here's the, here's, the, here's the kickback. So that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Nehemiah says we need to come together and we need to do God's work so God may be glorified. Jesus prays to the Father in John chapter 17. He says, I want them to be one and I want them to be unified in their work. And I want the glory that you have given me and that I have now given, that you have given me, that I have now given them, I want that to be demonstrated so you might be glorified. And in the end, there's this idea so, 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 uh, where, where it says that, that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as... You, now, let that sink in for a minute. That the world may know when, when we come together, when we begin to work with purpose, that is this purpose of glorifying God, when we do this together, the world may know that Jesus is who he said he is. And that, that the Father, through the gift of the Son, loves us as much as he loves Jesus. You listen to that. Let that sink in. Let that wash over you for a moment. You are loved by the Father as much as he loves Jesus. And that's why we are to reflect God's glory as we continue to grow in Christ's likeness as a church. Remember this idea of consecration of the sheep gate. This first consecration was a setting apart of everything. If you look at the rest of the passage, there's no consecration of any other gates. It's just that one gate that's consecrated. That's it. Why? Because if the worship is consecrated... If the heart of the people is, is directed and, they're, and, they, and they realize that their life is a sacrifice unto God, everything else is a gift to the Lord. Everything else is for him as well. And that's why the church, according to Paul's words in Colossians chapter 3, can say, Whatever we do in word or deed, we do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Because if our heart is consecrated to worship him and him alone, everything else is a gift, is a present, is a thank you to the Lord. There's this consecration that happens, and it should happen in the church just as it did back uh, around the city of Jerusalem in their rebuilding, and for that matter, in their repair. The bottom line is this, God is in the business of repairing. God is in the business of repairing. Listen. We are all broken. We are all people who stand condemned and have the same inclination as our great, 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 great grandparents, Adam and Eve, did. We rebel. We are selfish. Just like Adam and Eve, we say, God, we don't need you. I can handle this and I can do it on my own. And God is in the business of first calling us back through the work of the Holy Spirit, 
by applying the atoning work of Christ to our life and making us new creations because of Jesus' work on the cross as a result of our repentance or in response to our repentance. But in the end, right, we still go our own way and we still sin. And God continues to work in repairing us. He changes us. And so the, the business of the church, as it reflects God's glory and grows in, 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 in Christ's likeness, is not just that we, we make a decision and we consecrate everything to the Lord and we say, we are yours, but we also realize that sometimes we stagger back and we fail and we need repairing. And so the church isn't a club it's not about you knowing the special handshake and, and, and things like that and walking in through the door and you're like, okay, you're accepted. The Crawfords this morning are, are not here at Faith Baptist Church and, and, and aren't part of our quote-unquote membership because they learned a certain handshake and they gave all the right answers. No. They're here because they know that, that they just as as is the case with me and everybody else here, that we need each other. That we are part of a living, living organism that gives us life with Christ as its head. And that the church isn't a club, but it's a hospital. We need each other to bind ourselves up after the, 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 the rigors of a, of a spiritual battle during the week. We need to be picked up from the ground when we fall. And so the church reflects God's glory when it grows in Christ's likeness. And so the church has to have this purpose. It work, we work at this. We build this. We repair this on a regular basis. This isn't something that just happens by accident. My point is this. It is hard. Being part of a church is not a place of simply, it is a place, it's a harbor for safety, it is a place of peace, but it is, a, it is also a place where those who are a part of it work at becoming more like Jesus and loving one another for the sake of Christ and, and the testimony of, 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 um, to, to the world. The church reflects God's glory when it grows in Christ's likeness. And when it does so, here's the great thing, when, when this started happening, people are beginning to, 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 to watch. We're going to see this in chapter 4. We're going to see this in chapter 4, that, that there's, there's this response that happens and that there's pressure that comes from the outside. The bottom line is, is the church points people to God. We're, I know we're not Israel. This is just a New Testament picture here of the way that God is glorified now. It was in the Old Testament, his name is glorified and made known to the nations by Jerusalem and by his people. In the New Testament, it's, it's, it's the church. The church testifies to the nations that Jesus Christ is Lord and that there is no one by which, no other name by which people might be saved except for the name of Jesus. And so Jesus um, basically gives his, the, his, his followers this particular command. It's a new command, he says, according to John chapter 13. And it says that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And by this, here's the, here's the, again, here's the kicker, there's always that payoff verse in there. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you love if you have love one for another. The church ultimately is to point people to God. We consecrate our lives, we worship God, we set our lives apart and love one another so they might see the love of Jesus. We are people who are to, to rebuild and build into each other's lives that we might grow in Christ's likeness, that we might grow. Because the bottom line is, again, the church isn't simply a building, it's not bricks, it's not mortar, it's none of those things. As a matter of fact, the bricks and the mortar that were being built into the city or the walls and the gates of Jerusalem were not what was important. It was the effort of the people and the fact that things were being put back together again that ultimately brought attention 
um, of the nations to this particular city and to the God and the temple that was being built, the worship that was there. The church also is not a bunch of brick and mortar. It's you. It's a body. It has the lifeblood of Christ flowing through it. Probably the most beautiful New Testament picture is, is that the church is a bride. That hits kind of close to home since I just walked my daughter down the aisle last Sunday. And I know every dad says this, but she's the most beautiful bride ever to walk down an aisle. But the truth is, there is to be no more beautiful bride than the church. And while I saw, I should have been looking at Jesse a little bit more as he was the groom waiting at the end of the aisle for my daughter, I couldn't help but look at the bride. I know I was supposed to be looking forward a little bit more. I'm sure the, the photographer was not real happy with me, but I couldn't help but just look at my daughter all the way down the aisle. Because the bride is beautifully filled with the Spirit. The church is filled with the Spirit. It is surrendered. My daughter, as she's walking down the aisle, is making a statement to say, I align and surrender my life to my husband. He says the same thing. But if we follow what the Scripture says, he loves his bride. She surrenders to him. And as the bride walks down the aisle, she says, I commit my life to you. I surrender. The church is the bride that is filled with the Spirit and continues to surrender to the leadership of her head, Christ. She is bold in her witness. There is no doubt that my daughter loves to show off her husband. By the way, I know guys... We love to show off our wives. In the relationship to the church, to, 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 the, to the groom, the bride to the groom, the church needs to want to show off the groom. We should not be ashamed to let people know, that's my Jesus. That's my Jesus. I'm not ashamed. The bride looks absolutely stunningly beautiful. I guarantee you my daughter took several showers before that afternoon and put on perfume. And who knows what else she put on just to be able to be prepared and to look wonderful as she walked down the aisle and as she had her um, reception and as they went on their honeymoon. We, the bride, are washed in the word. We need to be in it. I'm not a, um, I'm not a bath-taking person, but we need to be bathed in the word. We need to be in it. She uses her gifts. She's active. She pursues her Savior And she's not bogged down by murmuring. She's someone who's joyful. She wants everybody to know how happy she is with her groom. The church is the bride. The church is supposed to point people to God. The glory of Jerusalem and, and Israel was to point the nations to God. And they are, they are investing for an entire 32 verses. It is listed one after another, after another, after another, after another. People and groups and, and names and individuals who are like, we are behind this. We are building Jerusalem for the name of Yahweh and for, the test, for his testimony, and so people might know the creator. What about the church? But the church is, as I mentioned, is made up of people. And often 
times they don't just happen, right? We usually show up here once a, once a week. Maybe you connect with one another during the week. But the place where the church is oftentimes most active is in their homes, isn't it? Right? With our families. And, and we're made up, we're, again, we're not brick and mortar. A church is not a building that's made up of brick and mortar. It is an organism that is made up of human beings, And so oftentimes, repairs begin in our home. This passage, if, if you look closely, mentions several individuals who did their work right in front of their home. I don't think that's an accident. They also have, each one of the names is incredibly unique. Let me just point out a few of them here. Oftentimes, I, I said, oftentimes repairs and health and spiritual growth begins in the home. Verse 10 mentions a man by the name of Jedediah. Or excuse me, Jediah. The name Jediah means he who calls unto God. Our homes, our church people, our home where, 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 where life takes place, our homes must be places of prayer. It needs to be a place where we all know that when we get together and, 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 and not just around the table with a meal, but when we gather together as a family, that it is a place where God is called upon. Is your home, is my home, is our, are our homes places where prayer takes place, where we call unto God? In verse 23, there's a... There's a guy named Benjamin who's mentioned. Benjamin means son of my right hand, the hand of power, the hand of strength. Our homes should be places where our, our children and our spouses and neighbors and friends can find a place where they can be strengthened in the spirit, in the soul. It needs to be a place where there's such strength that they find peace there. There isn't tension when they walk in. In verse 29, it mentions a guy named Zadok. Zadok means justice. Our homes, our church, our, where, 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 our, where, where our people gather, our homes must be places of integrity and faithfulness. Our homes need to be places where husbands and wives are faithful to one another. Where there's integrity and you can trust each other. One more name. Verse 30, Meshulam means devoted. Our homes need to be devoted to God. We need to be devoted. In the end, here in this as we consider working with this purpose of glorifying God, that really the, the, the end is, is what we need to do is we need to build and we need to rebuild and we need to, um, uh, we, we need to be uh, uh, doing repairs in our community by the grace of God so that other people, so the world says, Whoa. Whoa. What a God. We need to be a church that builds like that. By the way, that means that church will be uncomfortable quickly. But that means also, since it is uncomfortable, that we need each other. And maybe that's part of the uncomfortableness. <laughs> Sometimes we've got to work with others, right? working with people. And so God uses his people to build his work, right? There is this sense here that over and over and over, we need to be connected. As I mentioned earlier, it's not a club, but it's being part of a living organism. God's work requires participation of every single member or part. 
Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and he does uh, similarly in Romans chapter 12, and he uses this analogy of a body. And he says in verse 27 of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he says, Now you are the body of Christ, and you are individual members of it. We are all part of something greater, and it's alive. And coincidentally, the hip bones connected to the whatever bone right? Thigh bones connected to the shin bone or knee bone or whatever, right? We're all connected. We need to be, we need to understand that we are connected to one another and that the life throws, that the life blood of Christ flows among us. Every believer is a worker. This passage here, if you were to skim through it, uses or mentions all kinds of people. There are 38 workers that are mentioned by name, and there are 42 groups that are mentioned. 38 individuals and 42 groups. They are comprised of rulers and priests, of men and women, of skilled craftsmen, right? There are the, the, interestingly enough, perfumers and goldsmiths. There's no masons that are mentioned there. There's, there, there. There are no carpenters that are mentioned there. But there's these skilled craftsmen. There are people that, are, that, that come from inside the city. There are people who are participating and involved that come from outside the city. It's not just the professionals. I think we sometimes forget that Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16, begins with, quote-unquote, the gifts, those are individual individuals that God has gifted to the church, that he gave apostles and prophets and evangelists and shepherds and teachers, but they were given to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. It doesn't mean that we don't work, but it means that you don't have to be a professional to serve. You don't have to be a mason or a carpenter to be able to do the work of building a wall. I have, right, and maybe you, you, you can relate to this too. You, you have, maybe you, you don't have any um, do-it-yourself type of skills or whatever. I don't. I just break stuff. But the, but the bottom line is, but the bottom line is, is, is hey, I'll pitch in. If you want me to lift something, move something, whatever, I'll, I'll lift something, I'll move something, I'll pull something, I'll do whatever. Pull my back. Um, but the bottom line is, is hey, I'll, I'll help. I may not be able to do the skilled labor, but I can throw a brick or I can, I can pass, a, pass a hammer or, or put in a screw or something like that, and I'm talking figuratively here. I'll do whatever. In the end, the reason why we do this is so that from the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. That's the idea. It's not just the professionals. It's not just the ultra-spiritual or seemingly perfect. It's interesting that in this passage, there's an individual who's mentioned who is referred to in Ezra chapter 4, and is chastised by Ezra because of his sin. He's working here. He apparently repented, got things right, and he is involved. You don't have to be perfect to be involved in the church. As a matter of fact, like I said, we're a hospital. We're here to help. We're here to grow. I need your help. It's for every believer, ultimately, to be faithful, to be available, and to be teachable. Every part of the work is essential. It's for the leaders to set the example, but everything that you do for God's glory ultimately is sacred. And while there are always obstacles, these obstacles are an opportunity. They're an opportunity that, that people sought to be a part of from distance they even brought their children. There are individuals, there, there's a father who brings a daughter and works with, with, with her. How cool is that? Ultimately, God's work is best done next to each other. 
If you look at this passage, I have, I have just some notes where I just kind of scribbled on, on a piece of paper, some notes. Um, and on it, I just kind of circled how many times it used this particular phrase or a similar one. It uses this particular phrase, next to or after. It uses it at least 30 times in this particular passage. They're all next to each other, and they come after each other. After this person, this person worked. And after that person, this person. And he worked next to him, and she worked next to him, and so on and so forth. It's used to describe this cooperative structure that's there. So I want to finish with a passage that you're all familiar with. And it's found in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 through 12, that says, Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But now, but how can uh, one keep warm alone? Though one will be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. This is a next to passage. This is a next to passage. It has the idea that there is this, this great work with tremendous purpose of glorifying God and that we can't do that particular work alone, but we have to do it together. And there's tremendous benefit and joy in doing that together. Teamwork leads to this incredible synergy and the, the, the sum of the parts is greater, or the, 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 um, uh, the, 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 the sum total of the parts is greater than just the individual parts by themselves. There's this greater return when we have teamwork, according to verse 9. There's tremendous support that happens. Verse, verse 10 says, if one falls down, one can help him up, but pity the one who falls and has no one to help him up. Teamwork provides support Teamwork offers friendship and intimacy. The, the picture is quite intimate. It talks about two individuals getting under a blanket or in a sleeping bag together because it's cold. And the idea here is, is that, that there's, there's, there's tremendous friendship and intimacy and closeness when we work together side by side. And teamwork leads to accountability and, and discipleship. The last verse um, we've been talking about or the, the, the parts are always two and two and two. But at the end it says, a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Where two or more are gathered together in his name, right? He is, he is there. Where two or more are gathered together, he is there. And so we know that the work is hard. But I know that the NFL season is starting here as well, and so it's, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be a bad idea maybe to just quote Vince Lombardi, right? Who said uh, that work, or the harder that you work, the harder you work, the harder it is to surrender. The harder you work, the harder it is to surrender. Work is hard. We want to we see God build the body up here. We want you to, to have a place here where, where you can not only sit in a pew or sit in a chair, but where you can be involved and you can use your gifts and you can be conformed to the image of Christ. But that means that we all have to work together on this. We can't have atrophy happening in different places of the body. We need the body to continue to, to have energy and, and have Christ, Christ's lifeblood just kind of throbbing through it. The truth is, on this particular passage, I didn't mention it, but I'll mention it now, some didn't come together. The, the, um, there, there's a group or a little town that's about five miles away from Jerusalem, uh, and it is populated by individuals that are named after the town, the, 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 the Tekoites. And the Tekoites came and, and they served, but it says there, I believe in verse 6, excuse me, verse 5, it says the Tekoites repaired, but their nobles would not stoop to serve their Lord. And the Lord there is capital L. They didn't come to serve God. They weren't willing to do it. They were too good for that. It takes all parts. 
Some didn't. My question to you as we close is, will you? Will you? Will you be willing, when you think of doing God's work according to his purposes, for his glory, will you be willing to consecrate every part of your life and say, I'm going to consecrate my worship and my submission and my heart to the Lord so much so that everything else in my life begins to be permeated by doing things for for Christ. That's my desire. Don't be like the nobles who said, we're not going to be involved. Will you, will you consecrate yourself to the work of God to the place where God has put you right here. That is my prayer. I ask that it might be yours as well. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word today as we close with this little chorus that we sang earlier. Lord, our desire is to to worship you and to praise you. But to do so, we have to put things into action. It means that we have to work. It means that we have to be involved in repairing being involved in the repairing of of our own lives and allowing you to to repair the lives of others, using us for that particular purpose. Heavenly Father, we pray that it would be done your way, that we would use your resources, prayer, your word. We pray that it would be done for your glory. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand as we close with this little chorus? We have the ladies just finish us or lead us in this. And uh, let's sing it to the, the Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord, you've heard our prayer. 
Lord, may we glorify you, the triune God, in, in all that we all that we do, all that we think, all that we say. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you might unite us. Lord, shoulder to shoulder, side by side, next to each other. Lord, for for your glorious name's sake. We pray, Heavenly Father, that your your church, the body, the bride, might be beautiful. Lord, that um, as you scan across this particular place and you see its actions, each one individually, Lord, that, uh, that, Lord, it would just put a smile on your face. Lord, and that the world would look and say, wow, what a great God they serve. If he can use them, if he can use, <laughs> he can use Matt, goodness, what a great God he must be. Lord, send us out. Impress that on our hearts. Help it not to leave our minds. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great day. Oh, and by the way, take the opportunity to meet uh, Steve and Kathy Crawford as well before they head out. Introduce yourself in case they haven't yet had a chance to meet you yet as well. Thanks. Have a great day.